About 11,000 years ago in the Pleistocene, many lowland portions of the American West were filled with water to create spectacular Ice Age lakes like ancient Lake Bonneville and Lake Manly. Today, however, due to changes in the climate, these lakes are all but, if not completely, dried up, leaving behind large, flat, bright basins, what we call playas, with at best an ephemeral puddle compared to the ancient ecosystems they were. Just imagine we're traveling through the Mojave Desert, through dusty basins and past dry mountain ranges, and we crest over the hill to the site of this beautiful blue lake. It's 15 miles long, about 10 miles wide, and about 30 feet deep, and it's reflecting the jaw-dropping, snow-capped Sierra Nevada mountains to the west and the white mountains to the east. So how far back in time have we stepped to see this amazing lake? Wait a minute. It's 1873. That's right. Owens Lake, the lake that once filled this valley, hadn't actually completely dried up in modern times. It was a remnant from a once larger place to see lake system, but much like the Great Salt Lake today, once the much larger Lake Bonneville, Owens Lake was still around up until the 1900s. Owens Lake held on to modern times until the year 1913, when it began to abruptly dry up. So what happened to Owens Lake, now Owens Dust Bowl? Well, we're going to be uncovering that story today. Back to Let's Go Geo, everyone. As usual, I'm your field guide, Heather, and today we are in Eastern California, where a once gorgeous blue lake suddenly went dry. Today, we have to say its name a little different, Owens Dry Lake. And today, we're going to look into what happened to this lake. This is the Owens River. It headwaters north of here, north of Mammoth, east of Yosemite, from the Sierra Nevada mountains. From there, it flows down through the Owens Valley, gathering water from the adjacent mountain streams and continues to flow all the way down to its terminus, filling Lake Owens. At least it did. In the 1800s, the quiet Owens Valley was actually quite the happening place. With the California mining boom and new railroads set, the mountains on each side of the valley, the Sierra Nevadas to the west, and the White Mountains and Inyo Mountains to the east, were soon pitted like Swiss cheese with mining prospects. One of the largest of these mining operations was the Cerro Gordo mine located on the east side of the lake in those mountains. This was a silver and lead and zinc mine primarily. And at its peak in the 1800s, it had thousands of residents, hundreds of buildings. And over time it produced tens of millions of dollars worth in precious metals. In 1873, there are stories of the miners actually stacking the pigs, another word for those 18-inch loaves of heavy metals, each worth about $30 a piece. They stacked them like bricks, put canvas over top of it, shelter. The ore was hauled by mule down the mountain. And over there on the east side of the lake, near a place called Swansea, was the smelter to turn that rough ore into those shiny buoyants. The smelter ran on charcoal. The large valley you see behind me in those mountains is the cottonwood drainage, and it's on the west side of the lake, but it's actually the source of the wood for the mines. In fact, if you look behind me right here, you can see a large scar in the mountains. That's from a log flume that broke. The wood was burned in these charcoal kilns, and then the charcoal was shipped across the lake to feed the smelter. Yeah, you heard me right. I said shipped across the lake, an image that serves as a testament to the lake's grand size in the 1800s. In fact, this town of Cartago was known as a bustling port city where supplies like food, liquor, grain, and machinery was swapped for cargo from the mines on large barge-like vessels like the Bessie Brady. Around the lake, bright white minerals like those that you see piled behind me were also mined. This included marble, soda, and salts, especially at places like Keeler and Bartlett, where evaporative minerals were mined. Evaporative processes in this salty blue lake caused the natural deposition of salts like sodium carbonate via precipitation. 
basically the saturation gets so high that the salts literally crystallize out of solution. Seasonal chemical changes allowed for the production of a variety of sodium carbonates, including trona ore, a compound processed into soda ash. Soda ash is used in the processing of borates, still done in this area today by U.S. Borax, part of Rio Tinto Mining. Soda ash is also used in the manufacture of detergents and soaps, paper and glass. In fact, the demand for soda ash today is on the rise, and that's primarily due to its use in the manufacture of photovoltaic cells, which are used in the manufacture of solar panels. And by the way, China has historically been one of the world's largest producers of soda ash, but Green River, Wyoming has possibly the world's largest deposit of soda ash and is expanding operations as we speak. Meanwhile, over the span of the 17 and 1800s, a small Mexican village was sprouting, known as El Pueblo de Nuestra Señora, La Reina de los Angeles del Rio Porquincula. The village met its water needs by digging a network of sanjas, or water ditches. These would later be guarded by sanjeros, or the ditch guards. Now keep in mind that during this time, there were a lot of major changes going on. The U.S. acquired land that now includes California and our little village with a big name in 1850. Also, the western mining boom was in full speed. Our little village grew into one of the largest U.S. metros. The little village got bigger, the name got smaller. You know it today as Los Angeles. Meanwhile, the stacks of metal bullion from here were destined for over there, way over there. Moved along about a dozen or so temporary stations along the route by 80 teams, each with three wagons and about 170 bars, each bar also weighing about 80 pounds a piece. An LA News story quoted, to this city, Cerro Gordo trade is invaluable. What LA now is, is mainly due to it. It is the silver cord that binds our present existence. Should it be unfortunately severed, we would inevitably collapse. But it turns out silver and lead would not be the only things from Owens Valley that LA was built on. And the city would need something else from these mountains, something even more precious than metal. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So, Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. In 1877, a man stepped ashore at El Pueblo de los Angeles. His name was William Maholland initially serving as the Sanjero and later the head of various water organizations for the city, he would change the face of L.A. forever, and not just L.A. In the 1900s, he started condemning the Sanja system and proposing new sources of water for the city. This ditch gathers water from the adjacent mountains destined for Owens Lake. But if we follow this ditch of water, we'll see it actually flows. That's right all the way down to L.A. Maholland and some others, in what's been labeled as socio-political chicanery, began buying up land hundreds of miles from L.A. here in the Owens Valley, and lots of it. They also bought up a bunch of land around San Fernando Valley, giving them the dubious title of the San Fernando Syndicate, We'll see why in a bit. Signs like this can be found all over the valley, and it's proof of L.A.'s footprint here. By the 1900s, Maholland had many convinced that L.A., in need of a new water source, should get it by piping it from here to L.A. Construction began in 1908 and involved a massive infrastructure project, beginning with a new cement plant in Monolith to produce over a thousand barrels of cement a day, requiring over a hundred new miles of railway, the building of over 200 miles of conduit, which include opened and lined canals and a lot of concrete and tunnels plus steel siphons, 
the construction of two hydroelectric plants, one of which is here in Cottonwood Creek area, where the Cottonwood Creek actually goes into the hydroelectric plant, and then after which is dumped into the LA Aqueduct. Also 240 miles of telephone line and 500 miles of new roadway, just to begin with. By 1913, the first of these waters flowed on down to LA, but not without a fight. Locals protested by dynamiting parts of it and opening up sluice gates. And apparently some people are still upset about it today. Also over this time, LA sextupled its land area. And this was due to the aqueduct and the city charter, which stated that the towns around LA couldn't purchase water from LA. Therefore, most of them annexed themselves to be part of LA. Oh yeah, and remember the San Fernando Syndicate? Well, this included Mulholland along with Fred Eaton, the mayor, Harrison Otis, a LA Times publisher, and Henry Huntington, a railroad executive. And it turns out that if we look at where the LA aqueduct ran through, San Fernando Valley grew tremendously due to the aqueduct. And these guys have been accused of knowing that this would be the case, Hence the reason why they bought up all the land there and benefited tremendously. Meanwhile, over these years, the battle ensued for Hetch Hetchy. This is an area near Yosemite that is often said to be of equal or greater beauty as Yosemite Valley. Put on hold for decades, in 1906, the great San Francisco earthquake added new fuel to the fight. And by 1934, Hetch Hetchy was dammed, filling that valley and the meadows there too. LA and friends were also looking for a place to build a new dam and they chose the Long Valley area, but Eaton refused to sell at the price they offered. So instead they built the St. Francis Dam around 1926. Meanwhile, at Owens Lake, trouble ensued. By 1926, the lake was declared dry. People at Cerro Gordo once proclaimed ducks were by the square mile millions of them. When they rose in flight, the roar of their wings could be heard on the mountaintop at Cerro Gordo, 10 miles away. Looking at the otherworldly dry lake bed that it is today, it can be hard to imagine that it actually was once that beautiful blue lake only about a century ago. But the evidence abounds. From the tales of the steamships hauling ore to the thunderous sound of the flapping of duck wings and a thunderous sound below foot. In 1872, a large earthquake struck the Owens Valley, leaving behind scarps or ridges of visible land displacement from the earthquake. You can see some of these scarps around the lake still today. In fact, you can see a scarp that cuts right through Crater Mountain around Big Pine. But there are also some other lines around the lake, sort of circular ones. Those are bathtub rings or markers of historic lake levels. What's interesting about these bathtub rings though is that they don't appear to be impacted by the earthquake or cut by a scarp. There's no displacement in them. Hmm. So that means that these rings must have been deposited after the 1872 earthquake and of course sometime before the 1913 siphoning. Only two years after the lake was declared dry, the St. Francis Dam cataclysmically failed in 1928, serving as one of the largest man-made flood disasters in U.S. history, killing 431 people. When the lake dried up, soda operations changed drastically. The natural processes were altered, forcing the company to have to mechanically produce the sodium carbonates and leading to a settlement with the city of LA. The company then built a new plant. It burned down. They built another plan. Unfortunately for them, in the 30s, there was a very wet year, which prompted LA to divert some of the excess water back into Owens Lake, which flooded the new plant, leading to more court hearings, and in part, the creation of another dam. The Long Valley area finally got its dam, creating Lake Crowley and flooding those meadows in 1941. In the 30s and 40s, the Mono Basin Extension, a series of diversions of streams that were destined for Mono Lake, ensued. And another major aqueduct was built, the Colorado River Aqueduct, donning a new age of dams and diversions that would forever change the Colorado River and the American Southwest. And by around the 70s, two more major aqueducts would be constructed. There's the California State Aqueduct, which brings water down from the north, and yet another 
second LA aqueduct to bring water from the east from the Owens Valley once again. By now you're probably surprised that there's any liquid left in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Well, both poor water management and the exacerbating effects of a changing climate, both regionally and globally, certainly aren't helping. Speaking of air quality, one of the worst results of a dry Lake Owens was the dust, toxic dust. For decades, alkali dust laced with heavy metals showered the area some 30 miles in all directions, especially when the winds kicked up, which is often here. But there's more. Aerial images or even a good close-up at times depicts a red tinge on the lake. What causes this red tinge? Well, it's a result of halobacteria, and despite the name, they're actually archaea. These halophiles, or salt-loving organisms, are what's responsible for turning the salt pink. They're also what's responsible for causing severe respiratory issues. Giving it the infamous award of being quite possibly the single largest source of PM10 emissions in the U.S., ten times as dusty as what would be expected in any other desert across the American West. And as a result of all of this, authorities must now, ironically, add water to the lake in order to keep down the dust. And as we plunge into a future of a troubled Colorado River in American Southwest, a shrinking Great Salt Lake, of which many fear might go the way of Owens, as well as an unstable climate outlook and more water woes, possibly water wars, the Owens Lake story serves as a great tale, maybe even an eerie foreshadow of what can happen when humans alter natural hydrologic systems. Thank you.